The reading this evening is from Matthew 6, verse 5 to 14. You can find it on page 970 in these Bibles. And as Steve says, if you don't have a Bible right now, do feel free to pop to the back and get one. (laughs) Prayer. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good evening. Good to see you all. So, last week, Lou spoke about uh, God being our Father. So, she looked at who God is, who God isn't, and then how that shapes our identity. Uh, And she was talking about how we are loved children of God, and that that changes everything. This morning, I got a whoop from over here, uh, but hey... Hopefully you'll wake up at some point. Um, But in the Lord's Prayer, when we read the Lord's Prayer, once you've prayed, Our Father in Heaven, you follow that with, Hallowed be your name. And that's what we're talking about tonight. Uh, We're going to explore what praying that prayer um, looks like. So firstly, we're just going to think a little bit about how to pray. um, Because the disciples ask Jesus in Luke how they should pray. And Jesus gives them this prayer. Um, There was a boy who was out for a birthday meal uh, with his parents. And he just started tucking into his pizza or whatever it was. And they were like, son, you know, aren't you going to pray before you eat? uh, Like we do at home. And he was like, well, here, the chefs know what they're doing. (laughs) (laughs) A little harsh, but anyway. So... When we think about um, the disciples asking, how do we pray? I wonder if that's a question that you're asking of God. How should I pray, Lord? I imagine if you're anything like me, we're all asking for help. We we could all use some help. And Jesus gives a few tips. Um, Abby kind of read that brilliantly about, you know, pray in secret. Don't make a show of it. Don't worry about saying the right words. God knows what's on your mind, so just pray. Uh, He knows what's going on. And in the same way Lou talked about who God is and isn't, I thought we could look briefly at what the Lord's Prayer is and isn't. So the Lord's Prayer is not a kind of magic formula, um, a charm or a spell to say over a prayer to make something happen um, that we want. And then the Lord's Prayer is not to be said without thinking. Um, In our staff prayers every day, um, after we've prayed for for you guys, we pray the Lord's Prayer. And unfortunately, I have to admit that sometimes it's a bit of a cue for me to start 
thinking about other things. I don't know if you find that happens to you. In Men of Bacon, we've been reading this cracking book on prayer, and it's, it's written by a chap called James Martin, who's a Jesuit priest based in New York. And it's really interesting because there's a lot of stuff in here from a more Catholic perspective, and it's really outside my usual experience. So I've been learning tons. It's really accessible. But he talks about um, this as well, and he says, sometimes when I pray the Lord's Prayer, I accidentally glide over the words so fast that I realize I'm not paying attention. When that happens, I ask myself, is this how Jesus intended for his followers to pray the beautiful prayer? One guard against this danger is to say the prayer more slowly and more meditatively. And then he gives... An exam- he gives an example of how to pray the prayer, giving a bit of a break after each line. And um, helpfully, I've picked out the most difficult bit, which is the bit about forgiveness. Um, but just to give you an idea of the way that you can use the Lord's Prayer. So he does um, this, as we forgive those who sin against us. That's always been hard for me. Maybe it is for everyone. But... When someone is mean to me, I get angry and it festers. Sometimes I wonder if you have to wait until the other person wants to be forgiven or ask for forgiveness. But now I know that's crazy because sometimes you wait forever. Better to just forgive. Let go of all that. Be unburdened. In fact, there are a few people I need to forgive right now. And I love that sort of dialogue that he goes through with God after each line. He, he just... Um, does that but it's interesting Jesus after having said to the disciples don't worry about the words you say he then gives them some words to say (laughs) and so actually it's helpful to think the Lord's Prayer is it's a bit like scaffolding to help you pray each point carries a lot of depth And it's memorable, well, it's become memorable to us, hasn't it? Because uh, we've learned it over the year. But that being memorized then gives you a fantastic structure for prayer. And it's worth just pointing out one simple little thing about the structure in that the stuff about God comes first and then the stuff about us comes next. And that's a really important way around for us to get our prayer life. Because remembering who God is just framing everything um, with who he is and what he's about is so important because then when we get into the prayers about us, we're thinking about who the God is that we're praying to about the stuff about us. I'm not getting in too much of a tangle here, am I? Does it make sense? It frames and gives perspective to how we pray for us and for others. So how about this line, hallowed be your name? First things first, what on earth does hallowed mean? (laughs) Well, it means to make something holy, which means we've got another difficult word that we don't know what it means always. Holy is something set apart, something other, something perfect. So if you imagine this prayer, hallowed be your name, can be heard as, may your name be made holy. May your name be made holy. And in a way, it seems like a funny thing to pray. Is Jesus saying that we should ask for uh, God for his name to be hallowed in the world around us? Is he saying we should pray for God's name to be hallowed in our lives? Isn't God's name holy whether we, um, whatever we do or whatever others do? It's a little bit like praying for the Pope to be Catholic or praying for this floor to be hard. The floor is hard and the Pope is Catholic. God is holy. Like, do we need to pray for him to be holy, for his name to be made holy? Well, let's think about two dimensions to making God's name holy, our words and our actions. Um, I think it is really important to mention specifically the words we use about God's name. Listen to James Martin's, uh, this guy's take on it. He says, hallowed be your name. 
Boy, I take the name of God in vain a lot. I say, oh my God, way too often. And God damn it, which is probably worse. Maybe I should think more often about God's name as something holy. Jesus is telling us that. What would it mean for me to hallow God's name? So this is part of hallowing God's name, how we use and how we treat his name. Uh, Whether we notice um, whether what we're saying honors God or not. I don't know if you catch yourself saying things like, oh God, and we might not mean it as an insult or blasphemy, but it's clear that somehow we're not promoting his name, but associating it with frustration, anger, or surprise, or, or whatever. But actually, it's, it's nothing to do with honoring God and promoting his name in the world positively. So God's name can be insulted or abused or defiled by his people directly um, misusing his name. So secondly, actions. God's name needs to be hallowed by our actions too. Uh, Michael Green, I don't know if you remember him, he was an amazing evangelist and uh, theologian and and priest. And he suggests a good way to think about the prayer, hallowed be your name, is, Lord, may we make you number one. Lord, may we make you number one. And that's saying we will live in the big things, the small things, in a way that shows we belong to him. God makes his own name holy um, so we can keep his name holy by living a holy life. Now, uh, let's just turn to Ezekiel chapter 36. If you have a church Bible, it's page 868, and it'll also be up on the screens if you can read that. So page 868, Ezekiel 36, 22. Therefore say to the Israelites... This is what the Sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I am going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. I think he's kind of making a point here. And this passage is referring to the numerous ways God's people didn't represent him at all. So they'd allowed other things to be number one. They'd made alliances with other nations, which had all gone wrong. They'd been worshipping other idols, setting up idols in the wrong places within Israel. And really, the disgrace of Israel, which is their exile in Babylon, is the disgrace of God, that he's become a byword in the nations. And the reputation of God needs to be restored. And when we're in church, like we are today, it's kind of easy, isn't it, to proclaim the Lord's name to worship him and say he's holy. But actually when we're surrounded by our colleagues or uh, we're at the school gate or we're in our neighborhoods, you know, it's tempting to drop our values or to change our language for God maybe not to be quite as number one as how we're feeling in church. Having that integrity of our lives being the same everywhere Um, is so important. Will we be distinctive? Will we hallow his name in every context we find ourselves? So praying this prayer is no small thing. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And that says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price talking about the cross. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Before Jesus lived, died, rose, and ascended, the temple was the place God chose to fill with his presence in the Holy of Holies. And once a year, the high priest 
would go through a very complicated ritual of making himself clean to make the sacrifice on behalf of the people um, in the Holy of Holies. And if you know all about this, he would even have a rope tied around his um, ankle in case he hadn't done the ritual properly and died in the presence of God. Because as you know from um, words to Moses and so on, um, God can't be seen face to face um, in, in the presence. So the whole point is, wow, God's presence is holy and I'm not holy. We're making these sacrifices um, for God's forgiveness. So the idea in 1 Corinthians of our bodies, our personhood, our character, our desires being temples of the Holy Spirit is quite a remarkable thing that it's not restricted to one place. We are a holy of holies. So when you receive forgiveness from God through Jesus, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you think about all the ways in which people make temples and cathedrals and churches look special to give God glory, to make um, it a holy place, they are hallowed places set apart to worship God, to show that he's number one. So this passage says, our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. So are we making it a place that's worth living in? Are we distinctive? Are we wholly set apart? Dallas Willard, the philosopher and spiritual writer, bemoans what he describes as the great disparity is quite challenging. The inconsistency between what Christians profess and what they practice. For the alert among you, you might be asking, but Rich, isn't your talk contradicting Lou's from last week? Last week we were told that we are forgiven and accepted by God. He's our father and we're secure knowing that he accepts us as we are. But this week you're telling us that we need our words and our actions to hallow God. Why is that necessary? Does that even make sense? Well, last week it was uh, Father's Day, and it's a day when our kids are sort of slightly more aware that they love us and value the relationship with us. And it's a day when they perhaps groan a little less about, you know, my style, fashion and way, the way I dance and sing and, and all the rest of it. Um, Nevertheless, um, my girls may be the most amazing cards, and when I asked them to fill the dishwasher after lunch, there were just sort of fewer groans and procrastination, which was nice. Um, so, of course, they love me all the time, and they know that I won't love them more for doing it, although you all know that I will. <laughs> but it's a day when they're more conscious of the value that they place in our relationship, and so they act in response. If we've encountered the love of God and experienced the incredible love of the Father, then of course we want to honor him and represent him well and become like him because we think he's great and we've got good ideas for how to live. And actually, that's why being continually conscious, continually receiving the goodness of God inspires us to live a hallowed life um, and we'll listen more to how he's calling us to live. And the, the, how Ezekiel follows on kind of sums up the dynamic of what's going on here. So uh, have a look at verse 24. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring, bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors, and you will be my people, and I will be your God. Just the most amazing words of scripture. 
uh, about God's heart for his people. Because the reality is we need the grace, mercy, and love of God through Jesus' death on the cross to forgive us and change us from the inside out. And Jesus took the penalty of sin and the power of sin to break through. And this creates this new relationship we have. And in that new relationship of love, that we trust him to know what's best for us, to follow him. So I hope it makes sense that putting him as number one in our lives is a natural outflow of an encounter with the grace of God, not to earn our way into his good books. So how can you make yourself a holy place for God to live in? Well, let's prioritize holiness. Jesus says that what comes out of a person makes them unclean. And we do need that constant work of giving ourselves to over to God to work within us. Simon Ponsonby, who is a theologian, preacher, and a priest based in St. Aldate's Church in Oxford, and he's spoken here a few times, and a few times to us while we were online. He said this, I'm convinced that holiness is at once the most important factor in the church's effectiveness and also the most neglected factor in her daily life. And when we think about the church's decline around the country, we need to get more God into the church. We need to let more of Jesus into ourselves and into our church so that we might truly hallow his name. And I think we're a more appealing church when we're putting him as number one, aren't we? And hopefully more people will be drawn. So let's think about how we might respond. What's next? Well, firstly, I want to repeat um, something I felt like God was saying last week after Lou's talk, which uh, she was talking about the prodigal son returning to the father and the father embracing the son and putting the ring and the sandals and the cloak over him. And I just thought it was a really significant thing that the cloak goes over these filthy, ripped, dirty rags that the the son's wearing. And I know that in Colossians we talk about new clothes. I'm trying not to mix the metaphors too much here, but, but I think there's something powerful about the fact that the father puts the, the best robe on the son, and he's, he's still messed up. And we're still messed up. We still get things wrong. But it's about being more comfortable in the father's clothes and in what the father says about us. And so I just love, it may be for you, that wearing your new clothes is the message that you need to take away tonight, to consciously be receiving afresh the grace of God. Um, the, another way that you might want to respond is to look inside, to search your heart. You know, at the end of Psalm 139, which is this amazing psalm about how God knows us and he knit us together in our mother's womb, and it's both comforting and quite disarming and makes us feel a bit uncomfortable about how much God knows us. And at the end of that psalm, David has this kind of heart cry of search me and test me and kind of see what offensive way is within me. And I just wonder, you know, for you, what patterns of ingrained sin would you say are remaining within you? What stands between you and God at the moment? Is there pride or jealousy or temper or lust or unkindness of speech? It could be all sorts of things. In what ways are we not loving God with our whole heart, mind, soul, strength? And I felt as I was praying this morning about this talk that there may be, it may be for someone here or a few people that chains need to be broken, that you've just got into habits of, of repetitive things that you know aren't pleasing to God, you know aren't hallowing him, and you would just love to break free from those tonight. Um, so that might be for you. 
And the third thing may be to ask for help. To ask God to renew you from the inside out. To recognize I can't change in my own steam just by pulling my own socks up. I need um, you to keep renewing me. um, To change my heart. And give me the strength to change in the way you want me to. And um, that's something we can ask for tonight. So maybe I could invite the band back up. Um, Why don't we stand on our feet and let's come into prayer.